Hello and welcome to another pre-recorded session of the IEEE International Symposium on Digital Privacy and Social Media being held in San Jose, California on the 1st of August. My name is Katina Michael and I'm the Executive Chair of the Symposium. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the main technical sponsor of our event, the IEEE Consumer Technology Society, for making this symposium possible. CT SOC realized that they required a transdisciplinary approach to address global pressing issues related to the design and development of consumer technologies and have called for diverse stakeholders to come together to respond to digital privacy requirements and matters pertaining to social media in particular. I would also like to thank for their patronage, our gold patron, the IEEE Digital Privacy Initiative that's doing wonderful work under the auspices of the IEEE Future Directions, and our silver patron, the prototype company led by Darren Colbreth. And of course, for their ongoing support, the IEEE Society on the Social Implications of Technologies Technical Committee, led by Robert Abbas in Socio-Technical Systems, and the IEEE Santa Clara Valley Section, and the CT SOC San Francisco Bay Area Chapter. We're grateful today to have Divya Chanda, Chair in Neuroscience and Faculty in Medicine at the Singularity Group. For our viewers, you'll find Devia's experience on the website uh, of our symposium. But for now, I'd like to highlight that Devia is an anesthesiologist, a neuroscientist, a futurist, an entrepreneur who works at the intersection of health, data, and data security. Devia's talk is aptly titled Digital Health and Biometrics Hacking Humans. Welcome, Devia. Hi, Katina, thank you so much for that warm welcome. Uh, and thank you to all of you who are um, viewers in the audience and thank you to IEEE. Uh, as Katina mentioned, I wear a number of hats. Uh, I've been combining my role as an anesthesiologist, someone who makes somebody reversibly unconscious for a living to peer inside the human brain and understand what happens as people transition between levels of consciousness. And I write algorithms to do this. But along the way, it's become very clear to me that there is so much biometric data that is being collected in this way and in many others, as we're going to talk about today, that we need to have new ways of looking at data, data collection and privacy. Uh, so with that, let's begin. So the things that I would like you to take away from this talk, whether or not you capture all the details. Number one, healthcare data no longer comes in the traditional forms that you may be accustomed to. And the increase in the kinds of data types that we are encountering is going to exponentially increase the possibility of combining, aggregating, and making sense of this data for good in the world, for things like health and wellness. It also creates new market opportunities, and it also increases the threat radius and the risk landscape for those data types. So we have that interactions between biometrics and things like healthcare, web 3.0 media, and there is this burgeoning biometric risk. And so what we're going to talk about today is ways in which we might understand this explosion of new data types, but also how we might protect ourselves. So here are the data types. Let's start with these. You have traditional data sources. So this is the kind of thing where you might walk into a healthcare setting and have your vital signs measured. And these might be collected and put into something like a paper medical record or even an electronic medical record. But some of the newer data sources are things like wearables and implantables. Here I mean things like invasive continuous glucose monitors or a cardiac pacemaker, or for many of you, even the smartwatch that you wear. In addition, there is something known as biometrics and biometrically inferred data. And this is everything that we can take or glean from, from a person, things like retinal scans, things like genetic data, voice, fingerprints. And when those things are amalgamated together into data sets to make inferences about people, we call these biometrically inferred data. And finally, all of this is taking place not just in centralized settings, but now on edge-based devices in smart home settings. So we have this new sort of landscape of not just the internet of things, but the internet of medical things. And much of this has actually been brought about 
because of the COVID pandemic. In fact, COVID was a forcing function that brought telehealth and digital health to the forefront. And part of the reason that that happened was to increase access. And during this, uh, during this process, for the very first time, there were changes that took place rapidly in this space that had never happened before because telehealth became recognized as something that could be reimbursed. And believe it or not, that's actually a major driver of the uptake of technologies. It's whether or not these things can be monetized. So what's the end result of this? Well, for one thing, uh, many more data types started to be considered healthcare, healthcare data. So an example would be fitness data that we collect. This was a study in 2020 conducted by the Scripps Research Institute and they looked at Fitbit data from 2016 to 2018, specifically things like the amount of sleep time and elevations in heart, resting heart rate. And what they found is looking at this data improved the prediction of flu-like illnesses and the prevalence in the five states in which they looked at this. Now, other types of sensors have been developed that have been specifically geared towards things like coronavirus pandemics. Uh, this is an example of a sensor that you can stick at the top of your chest and it can track your symptoms, things like your respiratory rate, uh, things like cough. Um, but there are other really interesting new kinds of devices that have been developed in this space. Uh, this one is, uh, is one of my favorites. It's called Facebit. It is a smart monitoring device that you can insert into face masks. What it does is it puts electronics in there and it actually can sense many of those very same vital signs. It can also sense if there's a leak in your mask. In other words, is your N95 respirator mask making a good fit at all times? Well, let's take some of this mask technology further and you come to this. This is a type of mask in which freeze dried CRISPR sensors have actually been inserted and integrated into the textiles of the mask itself so that these CRISPR devices are not now just for editing your DNA, they can actually sense and detect specific kinds of RNA that they are programmed for. And this not only would work with SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, it would work for other kinds of viruses and pathogens. Now let's go to one of the more common wearable devices that many people have heard of. These are heart rate monitors. Uh, this is an example of uh, the Zero Patch by iRhythm. And what it does is when it's affixed to the chest wall, it can continuously collect ECG data or the electrical signals of the heart for up to two weeks. But this brings an interesting, um, an interesting sort of avenue into the, into the whole mix, which is, what does a single human being do with this torrential amount of data? Enter artificial intelligence. We are now using AI at the edge in our wearable devices to help us interpret these streams of data. Uh, this is one of the earliest examples of this. This was a group of uh, cardiologists and machine learning scientists at Stanford who uh, began to use convolutional neural networks in order to detect heart arrhythmias. And what they found is that they had up to these 34 layer convolutional neural nets that were required to detect even arbitrary changes in the patterns of these heart rhythms. But whereas this was once now the purview of academic centers, this has moved into the startup world. And once again, this has also increased access. So Tricog is a company that is using a wearable monitor and smartphone detection but it was founded in India and it's enabled access to heart rhythm monitoring for people that are distributed in places where access to physicians is not so easy. Now we can move from not just wearable devices, but new kinds of passive monitoring devices. Uh, this is an example from a company called Circadia. Believe it or not, that circular device that you see next to the bed, that's an example of a radar based tool that can detect changes in the chest wall. In other words, your breathing pattern originally developed again for the detection of COVID like symptoms. It can be used for all kinds of things, including obstructive sleep apnea monitoring, monitoring children at night to make sure that they are breathing well. Um, and it increases the range of possibilities when you imagine that passive contactless monitoring 
may become a new system. And in fact, this brings us into the idea that the new collection landscape of the future is going to be the smart home. So that rather than having to instrument ourselves, we might be able to move around in the places that we live, the places that we eat and sleep, and have many of our healthcare needs monitored for us and to get feedback in real time. And again, bringing this back to the market space, the global smart home healthcare market has absolutely exploded. It was 8.7 billion in 2019, and it is expected to reach over 100 billion in 2030. Now, I'm gonna introduce a few other interesting kinds of biometric collecting devices. For those of you who might not realize this, you can actually weave electronics into fabrics. And what that enables is the ability for us to put some of these sensors very close to our body without having to fiddle with them all day. In fact, the one thing that most people wear almost every day is underwear. And you could have something like a biometric dashboard contained within your underwear, things that can measure heart rate, temperature, breathing, even your hydration status. And what's interesting is that this, um, these electronics can actually perform input output functions. It's, it's a uh, bi-directional. So there's computing that can take place within these textiles. Now, if you thought this was an interesting place to put some of your sensors and electronics, here's another one. This is a smart toilet. There are absolutely non-traditional biomarker signs of health. And collecting this data and analyzing it might be our future. In fact, you could imagine that within that smart home setting, in the future, everybody will have something like a smart toilet. And every morning uh, after you happen to use the bathroom, you may get feedback on your health status, your well-being, and you may even get new recommendations on how you should be spending your day and how you might be changing your diet. In fact, monitoring feces and sewage has been so helpful that it's become a major tool in our toolbox for monitoring pandemic outbreaks. The US Geological Survey actually maintains a COVID-19 wastewater surveillance program looking for hotspots in the United States. And there are many academic institutions and startups like Biobot that do this around the country. And they do this robotically in many cases. And let me give you an example. Um, it turns out that in July of 2020, it was you know a few months into the pandemic, People thought that the first wave was over. They were getting excited. They wanted to go travel again. And they were looking for safe places to go, especially things like national parks where they could be in the outdoors. Well, wastewater surveillance actually noted a huge uptick in, in COVID-19 cases amongst the local population and were able to send out warnings to people who were coming there to vacation. And COVID-19 was in fact found in the wastewater when they went back and did a retrospective analysis in Italian wastewater and even in Spanish wastewater. And what's interesting is this was actually found about a month before it was announced from Wuhan, China. So had we been monitoring wastewater for coronaviruses prior to this, we may have gotten a signal long before coronavirus had a chance to really get out of China and spread globally. And more recently, many of you might have heard in the last few days that there have been new outbreaks of the polio virus. Uh, last month, it was in London, and now there was a case detected in the United States. And so again, we might be able to use things like wastewater surveillance for pandemic monitoring. Let's talk a little bit about privacy here. This is a really interesting use case because the kinds of data signals that we are getting are aggregated, but at a granular enough level that you can get information about local populations without having to pin or tag that data to an individual. So it is a privacy preserving public health um, data signal type of technique that may find increasing use. And I want to also open your eyes to even more things that we might be able to use as non-traditional data signals for health data. So this was a very interesting example. Um, it turns out if you looked at 
Google searches in early 2020, uh, there were a number of searches in Latin American countries that were looking for an explanation to, I can't smell. And it turns out that these things were being found in places long before COVID had actually been detected, places like Ecuador. And so we might, if we could broaden our, our, our search and increase our integrative data fabric, we might be able to bring in some of these non-traditional signals to help us find things before they absolutely occur. Uh, another example, let's go to space. So it turns out that uh, there is an internet of animals and that kind of search function being built into our satellites. Uh, this particular um, sat that was launched is able to track animals on Earth, and it can track them in two ways. It can track either their migration patterns, so their movement, but many of these animals also have implantables. It's almost as if they have animal Fitbits. And so these sensors can give data like temperature and can track animals, for instance, uh, birds that may have developed bird flu. And this has been found. They, had, they found H5N1 virus in migrating birds and found that these birds had actually encroached into the space of domesticated bird species and found a vector for transmission, which ultimately brought avian flu to humans. So we might be able to start tracking some of our health and pandemic signals from space. Finally, we can look at things like population flows from space. Um, you don't have to just track animal movements, you could track human movements at a population level. And this data shows um, that measuring the flow of people out of Wuhan, China, would have been able to predict the spread of COVID-19 or the incidence or the flare of COVID-19 even before it occurred, because humans in this area were not moving quite as much, they were aggregating in one place. I'm going to give you my favorite market signal of all. Uh, this was an example that was given to me by a friend who had been um, looking at intelligence around the SARS epidemic in the early 2000s. And at that time, it turns out that the price of garlic had gone up. And this was mostly because people in China consider garlic to be uh, something that boosts their immune system and can ward off disease. And it was an earlier signal than the outbreak to come. So many of these data streams would enable us to create what we would call an immune system for our planet. And this is the ultimate internet of medical things. It's using things like instrumenting space and air and water and soil to become almost a nervous system for the planet where we can actually integrate all kinds of disparate signals and bring them together to make sense to help human health, public health, and, and care for people. But there is a dark side. And one of them is the security attached to this. And we'll be talking a little bit more about this. But even as we might aspire to creating this IoT-centric uh, immune system for the planet, uh, it turns out that in 2020 alone, more than 25% of the identified attacks in healthcare came through the Internet of Things. And if you actually look at FBI data uh, in terms of ransomware attacks, it turns out that the largest number of ransomware attacks by sector were in the healthcare sector. There were 649 in, two, uh, in 2021 alone. And unfortunately, this cost lives because these ransomware attacks would bring down hospital systems, medical record systems, and many people couldn't get the care that they needed. Now, we've been talking a lot about either wearable devices, implantable devices, or other sources that are maybe non-traditional that we might be able to tie into an IoT network. But I'd actually like to move a little bit into talking about the kinds of data that actually make us who we are. And another sector to be aware of is genome sequencing. And as the cost of genome sequencing has gone down faster than even Moore's law would predict, we also have this newfound ability to do gene reading for exceptionally cheap prices. 
uh, currently it takes less than a thousand dollars to sequence a single human genome and at one time only about 20 years ago it was on the order of a hundred million dollars so what is that enabled well CRISPR which many of you have heard of is a type of gene editing technology in other words we can actually look for misspellings in the genetic code that may be responsible for things like disease cut them out and replace them with the correct base pair or nucleic acid spellings. Uh, as you saw in the previous portion, we might also be able to take this gene reading technology and utilize it as a type of sensor for things like pathogens. Ah, but there are new market possibilities as well. And many people are trying to avail of cheap and easy access to gene reading technology to learn about themselves from the comfort of home. But this is not necessarily without a price. So the inherent risks. Take Ancestry.com for those of you who are kind of interested in tracing your genetic lineage. They have more than three and a half million subscribers and more than 18 million customer DNA profiles in their database. That means they are the largest genetic database in the world. And they are constantly being tapped by law enforcement to give up the DNA of banked individuals. Here's another thorny issue, ownership. You think you've uploaded your data to 23andMe. It's your genetic data, correct? The very essence of your being, but who's using it? And is the company that you have given this to claiming to anonymize this data, which is not possible with DNA and selling it to pharma for, for instance, to make a profit what if the company that you had an agreement with uh, in terms of your privacy is acquired? What happens to the DNA of the customers, which is their main intellectual property? The purchaser now owns that. And here is a really interesting example. In 2013, there was a Chinese company called BGI and their direct competitor in uh, genome sequencing was Illuma, Illumina. Excuse me. And they didn't have very much market share. And in order to become more competitive, they purchased an American firm called Complete Genomics. Then they turned around and used this technology to start banking genetic data of the Uyghurs. More importantly, this same company, BGI, went back to the United States in 2020 as the first outbreaks of COVID were occurring in places like Washington State and New York and California and offering for free to build rapid testing platforms for them. Now, the head of uh, the former head of intelligence, counterintelligence in the United States raised the alarm about this. He essentially said, what is it that China wants? What is it that they can do with that data? Nothing is really ever for free. And he had real extreme uh, concerns that the Chinese government would start banking uh, Americans genomes, which was a really uh, major concern. It could potentially increase the dependence also of American citizens for healthcare on the Chinese government. Uh, and it could also be used by the Chinese to predict which types of diseases Americans would develop. So a very, very unhealthy relationship. Um, there are other kinds of things happening. Um, tons of exploits by startups claiming to be able to read your genetic data. They argue, some of them, that they can measure everything from your athletic prowess to your palate for wine. Yes, there's actually a company called Venome, and they claim that they can choose or recommend the perfect wine for you based on your genetic code. Um, another thing, so Elon Musk is often in the news, you know, very lately it's been because of Twitter. But in fact, I don't know how many have heard, not, not too long ago, just a few months ago, he suggested that we should start storing and backing up all human DNA. Um, yeah, this might be possibly a backup system for humanity, um, but this sounds to me like a privacy project waiting to go wrong. And it's not just genomics, right? So the genome constitutes one of the most important codes of life that there is. But there is also your neural code. And let me give you a few examples. Uh, this is data that I'm going to be presenting that comes from the laboratory of Dr. Jack Gallant. It's publicly available on YouTube. 
And what they did in the Gallant Lab is they took a group of university students and they put them in magnets and fMRI machines that can measure neural activity uh, based on the amount of brain activity or oxygen being utilized. So when blood um, holds on to oxygen, it spins one way in a magnet. And then when it gives up its oxygen, for instance, to nerve cells that are metabolizing, it spins differently in that magnet. And by looking at this kind of activity, we can see which parts of the brain are moving up and moving down in terms of activity. Now, what they did in this particular case is they presented a number of YouTube video clips to these students in the magnet, and they measured the activity coming from the back of their brain. And then they created a data dictionary. So for those of you who are not familiar with uh, machine learning, what they did was they looked at the statistics in the videos and they looked for the correlates in brain activity. And they created these connections, a data dictionary, if you will. And then they put a new set of students into mag the magnets and they presented a new set of YouTube video clips that the scientists were blinded to. And what you can see is using the data dictionaries that they built through the initial set of experiments, through the training sets, they were able to predict what it was that those students were seeing in those magnets. And this is quite extraordinary. This is 11 years ago. Since that time, the Gallant Lab has gone on to look at things like processing, uh, semantic processing for things that we see visually um, and other kinds of relationships that are made in the brain. But essentially, this idea that mind reading might take off is actually a very real thing. Uh, the Japanese actually tried to reconstruct what people were seeing in their dreams by putting them into fMRI machines, having them fall asleep, dream. They would record the neural activity, wake them up, have them uh, basically um, keep a dream journal, and then they would correlate what they put in their dream journals with the neural activity and could predict dreaming in uh, during sleep. This obviously brings up an issue. I think Bob Dylan said this best, if my thought dreams could be seen, they'd probably put my head in a guillotine. And for this reason, we need to begin to think about this sort of dual use even of neural data. Now, neural data has entered an entirely new realm. Um, I apologize for this picture, but I wanted to just make the point that the highest fidelity is not when we do this kind of non-invasive imaging, it's when we take electrodes and we have them directly touch the brain because the signal to noise ratio is so much better. And this is the way that most um, brain machine interfaces that are used for people, for instance, with paralysis or who cannot speak, they are invasive and they utilize what you see in this image right here. Um, many of them, these um, 96 sort of sharp metal electrode arrays uh, that are about the size of a baby aspirin. And these can sit uh, in a part of the brain called the motor cortex. Now, this is the part of the brain that captures um, your desire to move, that interprets uh, the planning that takes place at the front of your brain. And then it processes this and it sends those signals eventually to uh, parts of your spinal cord that eventually reach your muscles so you can make those appropriate movements. Well, what happens is in people who are paralyzed, this information is captured early, it is processed outside the brain, and then it is sent to actuators outside the person because their spinal cord or their muscles aren't working. Uh, in this case, you see a woman who happens to be one of the fastest thought typists in the world. She can no longer speak because she has something that impairs her vocal cords, the ability to make sounds. So she's able to type using a keyboard and mouse, using a brain machine interface, as I described. Um, they have become more and more advanced, these communication style brain machine interfaces. Uh, one might even be able to imagine writing things down and these newer interfaces and algorithms can interpret this and convert this into someone's voice as if they were actually speaking the words that they imagined writing. Uh, here is an amazing example that comes from the BrainGate 2 consortium. That is that same baby aspirin style uh, implantable over the motor cortex that is capturing neural data in real time. Here is a woman who is paralyzed from the neck down and she is using her mind 
to drive a bionic arm to bring a carafe of coffee to her mouth. And this is the first time that she has been able to drink under her own power or agency using her mind. Now, this is, this is academic, but Elon Musk became really interested in this space. Um, he talked often about dangers of artificial intelligence. It seems to me that he was referring more to artificial general intelligence. So when AI might express something more akin to sentience. Uh, but in the interim, in uh, 2017, he actually founded a company called Neuralink. Now, Neuralink is not, um, it's not a one-off. It's not like they invented this type of brain machine interface technology. What they were able to do is to use a lot of the commercial capital that Elon Musk had available to him to expedite the development of certain improvements in this space. This included things like electric packing density. So you could record better signals from the brain. Um, they were turned into electrical threads so they didn't do so much damage to the brain. Uh, the power consumption went down. Uh, the ability to do this wirelessly uh, was introduced. And so what Elon did was he built upon the work of all these major academic institutions and started to accelerate this process. By the way, Neuralink is not the only company. There are other companies like Paradromics or Synchron that are in this space as well. But again, this device, which looks like it's a medical device, actually becomes an IOMT device. For instance, Elon imagines that the phone of the future that he's going to be building, the Pi phone, which will connect to the Tesla cars, will also connect to Neuralink and will also connect to his space constellation. So again, this is an area that we really need to be thinking of seriously. Now, um, invasive may not be the thing that everyone chooses. The idea would be that the smaller devices get and the less invasive they are, the more likely you are to see uptake in the general population, perhaps not even just for things like healing, but potentially for augmentation. One example of this is this um, nerve stimulator. It's a, it was developed at UC Berkeley. Uh, they call it neural dust. It's a piezoelectric device. So what it can do is it can take energy from one form and convert it to another. So in this case, it can take electrical signals and convert them to sound waves, but it can do it bi-directionally. And that means you can not only take these sensors, which are incredibly tiny, and spread them throughout the brain and the peripheral nervous system to record nervous activity, you can actually write to the brain using this device, using ultrasound waves from the outside. And when you deliver these sound waves into these devices, that is converted back into electrical energy, which can stimulate the brain and nerves. So bi-directional read-write device to the brain. Um, and to get more interesting, it turns out that there are even ways to write to the brain's circuitry from the outside non-invasively. So we talked about ultrasound just a minute ago. Focus ultrasound can be used even without these piezo devices to rewrite and to reorient neural signals underneath the skull. We can also use electrical stimulation as well as magnetic stimulation. So there are many ways that we can actually get to underlying circuits and write to them from the outside. Here's another very interesting one you can use electrical stimulation of something called the vagus nerve, which runs along your neck in order to increase the brain's plasticity, its ability to learn and acquire new memories. And that has implications both for treating people with strokes or who are undergoing rehab or who might have Alzheimer's disease. It also has implications for potentially cognitive boosting and cognitive augmentation for creating generations of super smart people. And these devices could be potentially used by the military, which is why many of these projects are, fun uh, are funded by DARPA. Now, this has also not been lost on companies. Uh, this is a few years ago, and Mark Zuckerberg was announcing at one of these F8 conferences that wow, I imagine you could type using your brain. And by the way, that's the exact same patient that I had shown you previous slide. Um, that is one of the fastest test, uh, thought typists in the world. And 
why he was so interested in this is because he had just acquired Oculus. And even back then, five or seven years ago, he was um, very aware of the fact that the that VR and virtual worlds would not be quite as sticky a platform if people had to keep on using hand controllers or leave that world in order to say type with their thumbs into a device in order to communicate. So he wanted something where you wouldn't have to leave these worlds where the, these interactions between your physical body and the virtual world were seamless. So where are we now? Um, here's a company called Applied VR. And they use virtual reality to treat chronic pain. And they have now partnered with another brain machine interface company, Kernel. Uh, this company is non-invasive. Uh, they use near infrared to actually image brain activity underneath. And the two of them are partnering together using functional infrared spectroscopy to look at changes before, during, and after the treatment of, of pain with virtual reality. Uh, this has even gone into the commercial space. Uh, so in 2018, there was a company called Neurable, uh, which had stated that it was going to create an EEG device that would enable mind controlled VR gaming. Um, that company never really managed to quite do this, uh, but it's in, in its place. OpenBCI, uh, Valve, um, for those of you who don't know, Valve is uh, one of these major gaming companies and digital content platforms. Uh, and Toby decided to get together to create a virtual reality brain computer interface. Uh, so Galea was the electroencephalogram version. These are the non-invasive brain reading devices. And Toby is an eye tracker company. And their idea is that you could take things like natural eye movements, head movements, and use that as an input layer, just as you would use a mouse or a keyboard or even a driving wheel, say you were, um, playing a racing game of some sort. Well, let's come back to Facebook, which rebranded as Meta. They acquired Control Labs in 2019. And the reason they did so is that this device that you see in this image is something called a myoband. It can sit around a limb and it can measure electrical activity coming from your muscles. In other words, my intention to move is captured by the band and analyzed and that information can be sent somewhere else, as you see in this particular image. So you might be able to use these myoband-like devices um, in lieu of handheld controllers, because by measuring muscle activities, you can navigate a virtual space for things like gaming and for social media. But you know, last year when Mark Zuckerberg announced that they were changing the company and shifting its focus to the metaverse, um, he mentioned he would also try to keep Oculus hardware to cost. And here were some of the many comments that came up. Uh, I'm proud to announce starting today, our company is now Skynet. And um, you can imagine that a lot of people had a lot of distrust. But the number one reason is that a lot of people seem to understand inherently that Meta would be willing to send you their, their hardware at cost because you, the consumer, were now the product to be sold. And this brings us to an entirely new field of commerce that Biometric Collection has opened up called neurocapitalism. It's not something new. Um, this was anticipated uh, a long time ago. This is an example of, in Minority Report, I don't know if how many of you remember, Tom Cruise's character goes through a shopping mall and he is fed personalized ads um, as he moves through that space it's already a reality. Uh, so uh, in Miami, there is a company called Alfie, and they have uh, tablets that can read a consumer's face and, and figure out their age, their gender, and their mood. Uh, they are partnering with companies like Uber and Lyft to distribute uh, these devices uh, in their those rideshare vehicles in order to serve up targeted ads to the, to the riders. Uh, and there are a lot of privacy concerns here. Um, another example is um, a number of companies that you wouldn't have expected, like Vons and Rite Aid, were actually using facial recognition without permission. So basically passive camera devices uh, throughout their stores in order to gauge interest, but also to basically track consumers as they move through their space. So 
a uh, lawsuit was filed by a number of human rights groups. Um, but these things are ongoing battles. And this idea of targeted um, ads and consumer capitalism has really expanded to include brainwave technology. Uh, this is a company called Bitbrain out of Zaragoza, Spain. Uh, but these companies are now popping up all over the world. This one uses non-invasive electroencephalogram EEG devices once again with eye tracking technology to gauge a consumer's interest in something, even when they're not aware that they are interested in a product. Uh, this is Poppy Crumb. She's presenting um, other technology like this on the TED stage. She is here arguing that you can use infrared cameras to look at changes in color and heat on a person's face and also their co2 exhalations to determine whether or not they're interested activated engaged with something so this brings us to all of these various data and privacy concerns so number one um is your smart home going to tell on you right um, is law enforcement going to come after all this kind of passive data collection in a way that you might not have realized that you had authorized? And this might be able to be used in a court against you. And do you actually have rights in this way? Uh, do you have the right to, to not self-incriminate yourself? Uh, things like taking the Fifth Amendment, which we do in the United States. And this has become a very um, murky issue because there's really no good policy or legislation that has anticipated this type of technology. Um, science fiction has certainly done so. Uh, this is a great um, episode in Black Mirror called Recaller, uh, in which a non-invasive EEG device is actually used uh, in order to um, see what bystanders may have seen to a crime um, but some very interesting privacy questions come up here. Uh, let me give you another real world example. This was a study that was done at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. And what they did was they put an EEG device on the heads of their subjects and had them type in passwords. And with a certain number of keystrokes, they could decode those passwords. And that opens up a whole new realm of uh, hacking possibilities I will set one up for you right now. Imagine I entered a virtual world and I was wearing something like a Galea headset while I was gaming. And I enter this world and I decided I want to purchase something. Uh, maybe I wanna purchase some virtual real estate or I wanna purchase a sword or an, a virtual asset um, or even go to one of those um, virtual McDonald's uh, that exists now in the metaverse. And I'm wearing this headset and now I, have to pay for something, so I decided I'm going to go into my crypto wallet. That information could be taken from me in real time by a hacker, and most people aren't aware that when they are instrumenting themselves to enter the virtual world, so that that, that sort of uh, boundary between real world and virtual world is seamless, that opens them up to an entirely new threat space. What's more, your brainwaves may not even be used as a way just to, for instance, steal from you. They might be used as a brain print, a way to 100% identify you. Um, this example uh, is one that came from the um, laboratory of uh, Sarah Laszlo. Uh, it was actually published in IEEE Spectrum um, publication 2016. And what they did was they um, put a number of these EEG devices onto their subjects, had them look at images, and it turns out that the electrical activity coming from the surface of their head was so unique to that individual person that they could identify them with 100% accuracy. And this brings up all kinds of difficult issues. Um, this uh, study that actually came out of Stanford demonstrated that if you take a number of people um, and you have them wear a very reduced EEG array, it can pick up activity in their brains that may identify them when it's compared to a database of people who have problems with addiction as being someone who is susceptible to addiction. And they were hoping that this kind of uh, information might help them treat people with addiction or predict people who might develop addiction. You might want that in the hands of your doctor or your psychiatrist, psychologist, you don't necessarily want that in the hands of your life insurance company or when you're interviewing for a job. 
And this brings up this idea of where we are in terms of creating digital twins. Now, digital twins are essentially a virtual model for something in the physical world. It can be an asset, a process, a product, a place, but an individual as well. And this is supposed to give us the ability to analyze or simulate, control and predict behavior and issues of a system, but it can also be misused to do things like creating um, deep fakes or digitally spoofing people, uh, committing crimes, um, or just using this kind of data to monitor and predict someone's behavior. So other examples, let's look at the IoT world. Simple browser bug, enough to hack an Amazon Echo. And as you have seen in some of the previous slides, Amazon Echoes have been around as crimes have been committed. Another really uh, interesting example, we talked about implantables as a new data source before. Uh, in 2018, uh, a bunch of white hackers brought to Medtronic's attention that during the software updates that were done wirelessly with the pacemaker devices, a malware could be placed on these devices. And the type of malware that could be placed could be programmed that could program the pacemaker to essentially deliver an electrical current to the heart that would kill the person and be undetectable as a crime. Um, Medtronic at that time didn't take it seriously. But as time went on, a similar um, bug was found in its insulin pumps, and the FDA actually issued a recall. Uh, just to warn you, we were talking about writing to the brain. Medtronic, along with companies like Abbott, they are one of the major uh, manufacturers of deep brain stimulating electrodes, the very things that we use to rewrite neural circuits. And as a result of this, um, most of these medical device companies have started to take cybersecurity extremely seriously in order to protect their patients. But there are some even more weird science fiction things happening out there in the world. Many of you, I'm hoping, remember the film, The Matrix. Uh, this is the scene that Neo is sort of strapped into the chair and he has uploaded in the back of his head while he's jacked in a program, a motor program to learn jujitsu. So, some people might think this idea of uploading a memory or a learning pattern or program might be far off. It turns out that this has actually been shown to be possible in 2013. And again, this was in an animal model, um, but uh, the Tonegawa lab at MIT demonstrated that they could record the activity coming from a mouse brain and re-inject it into another mouse brain. And that mouse would be behave as if that memory was its very own. So this idea of being able to not just now move memories around from organic brain to organic brain, but to recreate memories de novo, that's also been demonstrated in animal models. So we are at a place now where if you had access to right technologies to a brain, you might be able to take over enough of that circuitry to implant something with that consent for that person. And that's why I'd like to end with this idea that we are now entering this place where we have started digitizing all of these codes of life, the genetic code, the neural code. And this is really our most precious data. You might be able to replace your credit cards if they're hacked, but you can't replace your face or your retina. And so once this happens, um, it may be very difficult to come back from that. Uh, interestingly, it turns out that Chile, of all places, is at the forefront of this movement. Uh, they have actually rewritten their constitution and they have recognized neural rights as human rights. And in fact, within their constitution, they prohibit any intrusion or form of Inter, uh, intervention of neural connections through either brain computer interface technology or any other kind of system or device that doesn't have express and informed consent of that subject. So I would love to see um, the world going in this direction and for companies, um, international consortia and governments to take more responsibility for this. Um, the last thing I wanted to introduce is this idea that we might also be able to deploy uh, some future internet architectures to help us to secure much of this data that we're gathering at the edge. Uh, there are content-centric networks that are better actually 
at preserving privacy because they don't use TCP IP addressing in order for data to be found and identified. And um, because the permissions don't uh, represent something that can be easily hacked, you can secure this data much more easily. And you can also create data vaults at the edge, which would give back ownership uh, to the people who are producing that very data. So I myself am just a very strong advocate for what I think is our future. Rather than just having an organic biological immune system, I think we're going to need to create digital immune systems to protect not just our digital exhaust, but our very personhood. Um, and in this capacity, I work with a number of organizations. The Extended Reality Safety Initiative is one of them where we're looking to create standards for biometrics that might be used to enter these virtual spaces and find new ways to protect that. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And uh, Katina, I really look forward to having a bit of a conversation with you about some of these technologies. Oh my goodness, uh, the agenda. I don't think I've ever watched such a comprehensive uh, presentation talking about human hacking, starting off at the very fundamental biometrics right through to behavioral biometrics, uh, the internet of medical things, and then going on to wearables, implantables, and then beyond looking at the neuro. Um, I will be giving this presentation uh, as a staple for our new NRT students at Arizona State University who are beginning and working with Mayo, looking at biomedical devices, ethical implications, legal uh, implications, and just generally social implications. I'm just breathless. Um, I honestly don't think I've seen a presentation and I think I've seen most of them, if not all of them in this space, <laughs> uh, just quite like this. It's really positioned, uh, I think the next 50 years, um, as being critical to what may happen when we describe what you, you identified as neurocapitalism, and perhaps MG Michael and I described it as ubervalence back in 2006. Um, it's all of this uh, innovation, cutting edge, cutting edge innovation, these blueprints uh, that are in the laboratories. Um, we heard yesterday and the day before about Synchron, you know, beating Elon Musk to uh, some. FDA approved studies uh, have gone beyond studies now in syncing up the human brain, uh, the, the neural interface uh, in the vascular approach, very different to Elon's yes. uh, neuro, neuro, Neuralink uh, chipset and, and talking about this uh, brain to computer interface. In fact, you'd be very interested to know uh, when I was working for a large telecommunications vendor back in 1996, by 1998, the organization has said, forget about these things called mobile phones. Uh, we're going brain to brain and we're <laughs> investing in brain to brain interfaces and we're going to stop production of our handset because the future is brain to brain mm. via these computer networks. Um, ahead of its time. <laughs> ahead of its time, uh, the company went down in a big way, uh, given uh, some other reasons, post the dot com crash. But I, I wanted to talk and begin with interdisciplinarity. You're probably one of the most interdisciplinary, if not the most interdisciplinary uh, academic slash practitioner slash, slash innovator futurist I've ever met, and I've met many of them. But talk to us just about your journey to begin with. How does someone who's an anesthesiologist dabble in the tech go into neuroscience, if that was the way it happened, and talk to us about what happens when these disciplines collide. I'm often asked that, and to be honest, it's really hard to explain to people how this all fits together in my own head. Um, I imagine you have a really similar journey because um, you're so multidimensional. You know, for me, it, um, it started when I was a kid. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but uh, when I was about six years old, I just thought, I'm going to be an astronaut when I was seven. I built a model of the brain. I told my parents I was going to be a neuroscientist. My mother looked at me and she's like, how are you going to do both of those things? That's not really possible. Um, so what I did was uh, as I, as I uh, entered college, I started thinking, how do I get to space? How do I study the brain? And I realized that the best way to get to space was to make myself more useful in terms of the skills per unit, like 
you know, unit launch mass. <laughs> so if I could have more skills, they would be, NASA would be more likely to look at me. And so I decided to not just get a PhD in neuroscience, but to become a medical doctor. And I figured, okay, well, maybe they would want me. They interviewed me, they didn't take me in the end, but uh, what it did do was it gave me a whole new set of opportunities. One door closes, another one opens. And I had always been interested in studying the problem of consciousness. I know a lot of neuroscientists, by the way, who have always been interested, but it's very difficult to say you're going to study it because it was considered such a soft science, such a psychological discipline or philosophy of science type of thing. But I realized there was one field of medicine where it was very hardcore and actionable. And that was an anesthesia. Here we have drugs that we can give to a dynamical system, which is the human brain. And we could toggle that system at will and then just watch what happened to it. It didn't cause brain damage and it could be washed out. So it was reversible. Uh, there are very few things that open themselves up to you like that. And so there's like a cadre of us neuroscientists slash anesthesiologists in the world who are really interested in this problem of consciousness. And, um, <clears throat> you know, as far as the tech goes, you know, in grad school and in my postdoc, I was having to, I had to build a lot of electronics to do the recordings and the electronics and the algorithms just naturally presented themselves to me in the OR, in the operating room. I'm um, enamored by the multiple units of analysis that you think about. And uh, for many people, uh, they look at something and whatever it looks like, they call it that. You know, when I look at you and I look at the way you storytell, I look at the uh, different units of analysis, you're more than global, right? It's more than international because you have this space element. It's, it's almost at the universe level, but almost as if we're mapping back at the brain that is a universe on its own. So there are multiple universes because there are multiple brains out there and, you know, mm -hmm. 7 billion or so uh, on last count, we, we're getting there. Uh, and, and then this from the brain, from the brain to the other brain, from the brain to the computer, from the brain to the car, from the brain to the home, from the brain to the, to the, to the nation. And then, and then going out, out, out right up to that sort of, I don't want to call it a God view, but that Uber view uh, mm -hmm. right up there where you showed us the space station and how it's tracking animals and perhaps living things in the future and everything as this living, breathing entity, even if it's a, a tree, even if it's deforestation as, as an outcome of, of a human action. What can we build? I mean, uh, I started to look at the planetary skin idea that NASA was championing mm -hmm. around 2008, 9, 10, Cisco was involved in this notion of the planetary skin and a whole bunch of other organizations. We had IBM Smarter Planet. You know, there are all of these catchphrases now and the planetary skin wraps around enormous senses, senses, but at different levels of analysis. And that's what you're really talking to us about, I think, is this cooperation between different governance layers from mm -hmm. the local right through to the global and the universe level, you know, let's call it the moon for now and perhaps Mars into the future, but coming back to this consciousness, how do we move communities, organizations, governments to start thinking in a less selfish manner um, towards this view and, and, and what might be possible in your eyes? Um, okay. My answer might sound a little far out there, but I feel like we, every, anybody who wants to go, we need to find a way to launch them to space. Uh, I say this because, um, have you heard of the overview effect? Uh, it's, um, I read this book, it's called The Overview Effect. It's by Frank White. Uh, I read it when I was young, perhaps in high school, and it described the, um, the transformation that took place in some of the astronauts, not all of them, but in some of them, where they would report being in space and all of a sudden feeling as if their sense of self had completely dissolved and they were connected to the universe. And some of them maybe didn't get quite that far, but they would still look down on the planet and look at this beautiful blue pearl hanging in space. And uh, they were just overcome with this sense of love for the planet, wanting to protect the planet. Um, it was a visceral sensation of how there are no divisions between not just humans, but other species on the planet. In fact, 
for people who say, why do we bother funding going to space? The people I know who love space, who want to develop space, who want to send humans to space are amongst the um, strongest champions of the of the planet and its biodiversity I've ever met. And um, part of it is because environmental recycling technology was essentially developed for space. But more of it is actually because it changes something inside the human to see how you are connected to this, this thing of vastness. That's probably not the most practical answer. I actually have experiments I've designed to potentially measure this effect in space. Frank White described it. Um, I would really like to measure it at the neural level. Um, but I, uh, coming back to, to where we are, I mean, you're 100% you're right. The, the process is quite fractal, right? And in a way, here, I'm gonna share something with you. So uh, consciousness was, has been very hard to define, right? No, nobody agrees upon a definition. When I ask people, what do you think it means to be conscious? They will come up with things like self-awareness, um, but babies can look in a mirror when they're young and they don't have self-awareness, but we don't think that they're not conscious. Uh, and in fact, many animals will look in a mirror and have self-awareness before human babies do. Are they more conscious? You know, uh, some other people say, well, it has to do with attention or processing. And I, so I describe, you know, people who have had strokes and they become unaware of half their body. Are they not conscious or you drive home and you have no idea how you got there? There's always a violation. But the one thing that is true, that holds true is, well, why don't we just stop trying to define it and just say, let's look at brains that are completely conscious and aware, and then brains that have depressed levels of consciousness, just see what they have in common. And those examples are things like sleep. They're um, examples like anesthesia, which I work in, coma. And so there's a group of neurologists um, and anesthesiologists who study these phenomena and have compared notes and here's what you find. There are commonalities. Um, when the brain's level of consciousness becomes depressed, the brain begins to break apart, um, not physically, but it becomes functionally disconnected. So the modules that normally would be talking to one another become more isolated. Uh, the brain becomes hypersynchronous. Um, this is a more sophisticated audience perhaps, and um, some of them will be more aware of things like Shannon's information theory, but. But the idea is when the brain is more hypersynchronous, if what's here looks like, like what's here, there's actually less information processing taking place. So the amount of information calculated goes down in the brain. Um, another thing that happens is um, the brain becomes um, less complex. And let me describe what that looks like. So the brain is just a, it's a dynamic system and it's, both linear and non-linear. Um, and it's very hard to capture those systems for human brains because we do think quite linearly. Uh, so one thing we can do is think in maybe three-dimensional pictures. And so you can create uh, a chaotic attractor of the brain in these different states. And you can use one single EEG lead to do it. So you can say, measure the electrical current coming from one part of the brain and the EEG is just a voltage over time. It's almost like listening to a sound file uh, for people who listen to music. And what you can do is um, you can plot your first point um, in space uh, based on its position and time and, and how large it is. And then you can shift it over by four milliseconds and then put another dot and shift it by four and keep doing that. And soon, your brain, my brain were conversing. They're, they would look like a cloud, a sphere, a spherical cloud. And then if uh, you started to fall asleep and I had this on your head, your cloud would begin to shrink and then it would turn into a cigar. And then if I anesthetized, you would begin to turn into a pencil. Um, and then it would, uh, if I got you very, very deep, uh, your brain would almost look like a singularity. And you can imagine perhaps that these shapes describe all the potential places that the brain can go. It's its multi-potentiality that contracts and re-expands and I love these three definitions, complexity, information, functional connectivity, because I go back now to what you said. It, you could look at this at so many levels. Uh, if I were an astronaut in space and connected to the universe that might be expressing the sort of a higher dimensionality of, of consciousness, 
say, compared to even my normal awake uh, and aware state. Um, but it also enables us to start thinking about things like what happens if we connect brains to brains like your company wanted to do. By the way, a very basic form of telepathy is now possible. It uses non-invasive you know, recording and a stimulation, only a few bits of information, but we'll get there. Well, they've connected up three brains so far to play games together in a social network. Um, and if you connect brains to the internet, which is what we've done with these people who have paralysis, uh, that is increasing the degree of information that can be calculated and the functional connectivity. What if we've made these people more conscious in a way and sort of unleash this whole new possibility? Or if machines did this with machines, you could have hybrid models of, of consciousness. You could have completely inorganic ones. I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like all bets are off. This deeply fascinates me. It gets back to philosophy, psychology, mm -hmm. um, translation, of course, the new precipice of machine learning and all that you showed us about convolutional networks and neural nets and so forth. Uh, there's a spiritual element to all of this almost. Um, I don't know how to describe it, if that is the best word to use, but often it's an area that people don't go into and don't talk about. Um, maybe you want to call it consciousness, um, but there is some linkage to what does this mean? And if we can, you know, as we've already done with the Human Genome Project, you know, gone and looked at DNA uh, in depth and, and understood that uh, families share DNA, you know, you only really need mm -hmm. about 30% of the population before you have pretty much 100% of the DNA core of a nation. Uh, as we've studied with the DNA database, uh, the National DNA Database in Britain, um, where they have about 9% of Britons on the DNA register, which is a huge amount. Are you talking about the UK Biobank? Yeah, uh, no, yeah, the, the, oh. the National DNA Register um, oh. the, for, for criminal activity, even for petty theft uh, and crime. Mm. So, so um, and then you've got other nations, as you mentioned, Elon one said, what about if we, if we take everybody's DNA, yeah. but Iceland, that does it systematically. And then other countries are encouraging stem cell deposits and, and so mm -hmm. much, you know, at the umbilical cord level. But, but going back to that spiritual element, the translation, that notion of, that you mentioned on singularity, this oneness, you know, when I look at different models of disciplinary action, you've got the multidisciplinary the inter the transdisciplinary when you look at models or depictions of what is transdisciplinarity it looks like the singularity it looks like one blob where everything has come into to, to together what do you feel is the kind of new research that needs to now be conducted is it stuff in theology is it stuff in you know what is the future of consciousness is it new philosophical models of understanding humanity uh, as you showed us in Chile, this new, you know, rewriting of human rights to, yeah. to, to encapsulate. Extraordinary. Where are we going with this? Um, I want to say you've already named um, a number of things that need to happen, but it also brings us to this really interesting place. Um, you know, my, um, I should probably not bring this up, but my, my mother has often said to me, oh my God, you're, why do you like so many things uh you know it's not good to be that because to her it looked like oh that's going to be scattered you have to focus but i almost feel like we need to go a little bit backwards and take our um take people who focus in certain areas and turn them back into generalists because it is in doing things like this that they are able to make connections and each of those people because of their deep vertical expertise will make a different set of connections new things will occur to them by the way, it opens opportunities. I, I speak often to students. Um, if if you might have a disability or you're neurodiverse or something like that, rather than looking at that as a liability, um, I look at that as a new filter, a, a new lens um, with which you look at the world that is so unique. But one thing is I, I just would love to have people almost uh, just expand the range of their experiences because it just will really change how we're able to integrate across these, these many disciplines. I'd also like to see um, science and philosophy, spirituality, all of these stop fighting with one another um, and 
understanding that we might be working towards a similar goal. Uh, but that's not a really a new wish. I mean, I think a, a lot of people have have always wished for that. But perhaps siloing these disciplines is not the best idea. Some of the more interesting scientists I meet are the ones who have a closeted, deep religious or <laughs> spiritual background, because that provides them another filter with which to perhaps interpret what they are are seeing and measuring. It, it's funny you say closeted, uh, because uh, I think we're going to overcome that very soon. Um, just even considering, you know, what is the meaning of life, which a lot of us mm. begin with as academics. What is my mission here? Why was I put here? These fundamental questions mm. that we can't show, show away from will actually impact the way we potentially embrace these future technologies, deploy them and use the data emanating from them. Um, at the moment, uh, you know, for the last, I don't know, 20 years, I've been receiving emails from people who have claimed they've been forcibly implanted, for example, like the, the subject header reads, help, you know, I've been implanted, I'm a targeted mm. individual. And this is not uncommon to people who are researching our space, uh, whether it's wearables or implantables, you know, but gone is the time that I'm fighting people to say, well, implants are a real thing. You know, 10% uh, of Americans, according to the NIH, have an implant. Yes, it's not all digital yet, yes. but but it is. You know, when I started uh, reading about the work of the wonderful Christopher Tamazu, he was based out of Canada and he was a telecommunications engineer turned biomedical engineer. Uh, he developed the first digital band-aid called the digital plaster with Tumaz Tech back in 98, you know, and earlier. Mm. We, know, we know this because we've been working mm -hmm. in this space and we interviewed him. And uh, interestingly, he was talking about allowing the body to do what it does best on its own, sort of let the biology rule and do what it does at its best, but continue to interface on the outside with technology. And that's where we're going to see these smart devices deployed around us, um, as you so eloquently described to us in those hundreds, I would say, of examples you cited in a 40-minute presentation, which is flabbergasting. But where are we going to find the balance? Do you think we will have to bear technology in, you know, as you said, close to the brain interface? Or do you think we may be non-invasive and like the radar you showed us mm. next to the table? What, what do you think is going to happen physically in artifacts and innovations? Um, I think they're both going to develop in parallel. Um, for one, there is, have you heard of um, the human cyborg movement? Yeah, there's there's a it's not a small group of people um, and they are not implanted with knees and hips and pacemakers. They're implanted with new sense organs, um, you know, things like, uh, you know, things for detecting magnetic north, like a migrating bird or, you know, uh, Moon Rebus. She's got these uh, er, like vibration sensors and she choreographs to earthquakes and um, you know, Neil Harbison with the multispectral camera. He also has a heat clock. Did you know that? And like the crown of his head that helps him know where noon is anywhere in the world. Uh, what that does for me is it says, okay, uh, I put a new sense organ in. I need to create a new part of my cortex to actually, you know, I need a primary cortex for the sense organ. The brain is, is perfectly comfortable with saying, okay, you weren't born with that, but we'll fix that. I'm plastic. And it creates... A new, I mean, we have a primary auditory, a primary sensory, a primary visual cortex. What if you end up with a primary magnetic cortex or something that can now interpret these new signals? First of all, that's human directed evolution right there, right? You've, you've fundamentally forced the brain to do something, at a change at a time scale that it typically would not have based on the natural environment. Um, and then Secondly, I think it, it also expands because it changes the streams of information coming in, the type of consciousness you might be expressing. And so you have those people, then you have the people who are eh, not so excited about putting something into my body, but I'm, I'm down with those non-invasive uh, write technologies, read-write technologies. I think that's going to explode. Um, in fact, I think it's going to explode even faster than the... Um, implantables. And my only concern is that uh, as exciting as all of this seems, uh, there, there is no legislation, there is no regulation, there, there's just no protection um, for anybody. And so people who join these movements as enthusiasts, um, 
I don't, I don't know yet that what they're doing is worth what they might be giving up until we find a way to, to come together as a global community and protect them. By the way, I think our lawmakers need a hell of a lot more um, education and technology. Uh, I don't know what it's like in Australia. Uh, in the United States, the majority of our lawmakers have no exposure to science and technology in their backgrounds. And I think that's a major liability. They're also tend to be of an older generation. So uh, they can't even, they're not even keeping up with digital innovation at the pace it's happening. Uh, in some Asian countries, we see that a lot of the government is composed of scientists and technologists, but then they may have a different ethical viewpoint, like surveillance based uh, for the good of the greater society. And so yeah, we have some hard problems to tackle as a, as a global citizenship. I too think um, the legal aspect and the governance aspect uh, are far, far behind uh, lawyers like Gary Marchant at Arizona State University continually talk about soft law because we're lagging behind mm. in, in regulation and, and, and law itself. It takes such a long time to come into action. Uh, mm. What do you think uh, is going to happen to spontaneity? <laughs> if, if, if we can predict things, uh, as was depicted uh, early on, in a minority report. And I just wanted to say mm -hmm. uh, that example that you provided reminded me of something that I read about Alex McDowell uh, and his work and something that Brian Cantrell talked to me about at the time was uh, there was no focus of a smartphone device in the whole of the minority report. The emphasis yeah. was on the neuro. And a lot of people have spoken about this because for now we are doing passive monitoring using mm -hmm. these phones and uh, predicting lots of things uh, through search and through behavioral biometrics based on clicks and uh, downloads and the apps that we're immersed in. But talk to us about what might happen to marketing, what might happen to the potential to detect uh, a syndrome in someone without their knowledge. You know, they've gone through life, but now this, this uh, pervasive monitoring or persistent mm -hmm. monitoring is allowing for these new things to come to fruition and, and, and knowledge. And some people may not want it, but uh, yeah. talk to us about spontaneity and uh, whether we might well lose that through these new technologies. Um, I think spontaneity, that's a very, I don't think anybody has ever asked me that. It's a really interesting question. Uh, I think you're on the mark and spontaneity may be lost with a number of other functions. I, here's my best example. Um, I, I'm assuming you are old enough like I am to have predated um, GPS, Google Maps, all of this, and used to use paper maps um, for spatial reasoning. You know, when I was in college, I actually took a course on celestial navigation, built a sextant, learned how to use it. Um, when we were in Boston Harbor, we had to actually, our midterm exam was to actually plot fixes in the harbor and figure out where we were going. And um, I, I feel like when I speak to people who have not grown up like this, there's a part of their brain that never developed for this. And similarly with, um, with spontaneity encompasses a number of things. When I think of it at, at a neural level, it's sort of like, uh, it's a more prescribed input output function, right? It's almost been like laid down in advance. It's like a, a habit circuit or a memory circuit, um, but it has predictive qualities to it. and I, I see a lot of, um, I, I actually see the, probably the building of new circuits in order to absorb this, but the deterioration or the sort of stunted development of other circuits. But I have a possible cure or something to, to help with all of this. Here I am talking about the brain and I'm so enamored of the brain. Um, I am one of these people who is very firmly in the embodiment camp. And I feel as if the more time we spend in our bodies and in the real world, even if we're spending time in the digital world, uh, the, the more we will preserve very healthy connections in our nervous system. So a few examples, just the simple ones. If you deprive animals or humans of human touch, right, which comes through embodiment, uh, they don't just, these, these um, organisms don't just grow up scared and depressed uh, and things like that. They, they did a study, I think, at an orphanage. I mean, they, the children who grow up without any kind of touch and human contact 
have completely different wired nervous systems and they are not seemingly wired in a way that helps them move through the world easily. And another thing I have often felt is that um, we do, I mean, essentially your brain is encased in a, a skull, it's a black box, right? So without the embodiment, without the sense organs, there would be nothing there to shape neural circuits for learning for any of these feedback loops that make the brain what it is. You could artificially feed those, as I was showing you, you can program memories and actually create synaptic connections that match the memory you're trying to create. But it's not quite the same thing as being embodied and moving through a world and getting that feedback loop. So it's constantly going in this direction. Imagine, imagine the kind of um, learning that would be lost without embodiment. Imagine how much learning comes through just even if you don't like your body, even if you don't like, what does that include? It's like uh, your biological gender, your, your um, felt gender, all of this stuff, um, whether you are considered beautiful or not beautiful, intelligent, not all of these different axes come to us through our bodies and they are learning opportunities. Every one of them is an edge. Um, I was at a longevity workshop with, for XPRIZE. I talk a lot about longevity. The technologies are so interesting, so exciting. They are also hedges against not just aging, but just disease in general. But I did say to everybody in the room, most of whom were men, I said, what happens if you have the choice then to, would you all choose what your 30 something year old body, that was the best one you had and you're gonna move through life and constantly avail of these anti-aging technologies to bring you back to that place. So where's that growth and wisdom that comes from aging, becoming an elder, uh, learning about what happens when your body becomes more frail and perhaps fails you, or when you may receive information from someone based on the way they perceive your body that isn't how you imagine having, uh, I don't know, like built and optimized. So I don't know, I feel like um, a lot of the internal learning is gonna come there. And so perhaps the hedge against all of this is to remain connected to embodiment and move through the real world and not lose that. I really like that. Um, I often joke to people, gravity is your friend. Mm, yes. <laughs> and I think um, that's the embodiment. Uh, oh, you've um, seen The Expanse or read the books, right? I know. Uh, oh, oh, must yeah, read. Um, I have to, yes. I mean, uh, the series was great anyway, but uh, I actually really enjoyed the books. I thought they were even better because they could really go into things. But, you know, you have a society, we've become spacefaring and you have factions, right? You have the Earth, Earth faction, the Mars faction, but the Belters. And what you just said triggered this for me because the Belters, um, the first generation were just workers, but the next generation, they can't go back to Earth because of the gravitational constraints, because their bodies would just break. And how that changes the power dynamics, the, the way their psyches evolve, it's actually captured quite well. And um, that's what it makes me think of. And, and I certainly, gravity is your friend, right? It's like training at altitude, if you wanna be an athlete. And, and I too concur. Uh, I uh, had gone earlier through an adoption process uh, and the country, uh, that Australia was partnering with was China. Uh, we didn't go through with the adoption, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but we went through the training. Mm. Uh, and one of the things the social workers had said is um, that in some orphanages where the numbers were one nurse to 400 young people uh, in an orphanage uh, in parts of China, uh, the lack of eye contact, it wasn't just the proximity of feeding the child, but uh, they actually said uh, to us that no eye contact actually equates to death. Um, that's what they said to us. These are the social workers uh, who are experts in this domain, and they couldn't prove through evidence right. that a lack of on contact. But that made sense to me as a young mum uh, with the first yes. child uh, that, oh. you know, if, if there's a lack of eye contact, it means you haven't come close to feeding the child. There has been no proximity. Oh. And so obviously it would lead to death by default, uh, if there was a zero eye contact, it meant that the child was not even close enough for you to feed it as a, as a, as a baby, for example, as a, as a six month old. Um, and I, I think I want to stress that because no matter how technological we get, this face-to-face -face gaze of 
and and the technologies uh, that we're bombarded with on a daily basis and the overload sometimes uh, that some people like Christine Paraxis refer, refer to as allostatic overload means that we're seeing through one another and we're not looking mm. at one another. It's it's not to stare at someone and say, you know, I need to look at you to, to, to be real or to be alive or to be conscious, mm -hmm. but we're often looking through one another, not at one another in the best sense possible. So it's fascinating, Devia, that uh, with the quantified self movement, um, we're quantifying every bit of everything as humans, and we're trying to use that data to inform our um, approach to life, almost mm -hmm. in a, in the healthiest way possible. Um, but there are limits to our capacity as humans, uh, and limits to potentially uh, not the processing speeds, because we know that. Uh, and the human brain works much faster than, than computers work and are able to retain more in different ways in the brain. Um, and I, I hope you concur with what I'm saying there. But do you think, as Elon thinks, that at one stage we will be surpassed if um, artificial general intelligence is achieved? It's interesting you ask that because I, um, I, I come up against this a lot, especially with... Um, people who are either in AI or robotics. Um, I, I have increasingly, I, I, you know, I might change my mind, but I have increasingly come to think that it will not be possible at all if that artificial intelligence is not embodied. So it will have to, it doesn't have to be like a humanoid looking robot, but in some way it, it has to have a component of embodiment in order for it to achieve that sort of, <laughs> I, I guess Ray Kurtz, I would call it a singularity or wh whatever, you know, word or term you might want to use. I also like, you know, what is, what's the threshold? Have you ever thought about this? Like, as far as I'm concerned, I, there are a bunch of chat bots that have um, passed Turing tests already. So what's the, uh, oh, and there was the Google engineer who, uh, you know, claimed that uh, the AI he was working with, he, he was doing it from the perspective, I think, of ethics, so that it had become sentient. I, I'm not sure any longer where the line is, but given that I don't know where the line is, um, one thing we haven't talked about, but I just want to throw in there at the very end is, uh, do we really have to start thinking about these entities as also having rights? Because if they at some point cross that line and we don't know when that happened, could we be subjugating a new creation that expresses sentience that we should not be subjugating? Uh, and if we haven't thought about that, we shouldn't be doing this. I, I think that's a, a great point to end off on. And um, you've given us so much food for thought, so much coverage in that presentation. It'll go down in history, I think, uh, to many of uh, our academic audience be and beyond. But a question I've uh, ended up for every single person who's presented in these pre-records is the following question. So Devia Chanda, if you had one message for Silicon Valley, what would it be? Oh, I had one message. Oh, it's going to seem so mundane. Um, it is to respect our planet. <laughs> it's, it's to respect our planet because I feel like every core value and ethical principle arises from seeing the source of life by diversity and goodness that sustains us all uh, that that for me we're like a guiding north star that is it that's beautiful uh it's what we began with in q a and uh what we're ending off on here in this wonderful interview and presentation uh respect the planet well mm -hmm. i th i think um You've given us a wonderful model uh, to work from and to aspire to in terms of your inter and transdisciplinarity in your research and your practice. We'd like to thank you, Devia. And um, as a final slide, I think I'll show everyone where they could learn more about the International Symposium on Digital mm. Privacy and Social Media, a number of the societies we mentioned right at the outset, and to say, Please go online and search up Devia Chanda. She's given many, many presentations and TEDx talks and other uh, important contributions and learn more if you're interested in this field about its uh, reach, about how you can get involved 
and send out a note and give some feedback. Uh, and we'd love to see you both uh, in person and virtually at the symposium on the 1st of August. To be a Chanda, it's been great to spend this hour and a bit with you. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you for hosting me. Thank you. Thank you.